So, so what we will first do is that we will uh, review the last lecture and then we will start the contents of this new lecture. So, in the last lecture if you remember we discussed we started our discussion on piezoelectric ceramics. So, basically uh, piezoelectric effect can be divided into if two effects one is direct effect and second is indirect effect and direct effect is basically uh, creation of polarization or change in polarization when you apply stress on the and this gives rise to change in the charge density on the faces of the piezoelectric material. And the converse effect is essentially when you apply electric field then you generate the strain at the uh, in the piezoelectric or deformation on the faces of the piezoelectric. And these two effects are very useful effect as we will see some of the applications. Um, and, uh, 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 and then in order to make piezoelectric material useful you need to pole it and poling essentially means is that in the virgin state a piezoelectric does not have any remnant polarization which means it is not very useful as a piezoelectric. It must have some remnant polarization to be used as piezoelectric. So, you pole it and then bring it back. So, when you pole it poling means application of electric field. So, when you apply electric field the domains as you know uh, from the ferroelectric discussion domains uh, start orienting themselves around the along the direction of an electric field and when you make the electric field back to 0 then not all the domains uh, 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 change their orientation as a result the net polarization is not equal to 0 and then you uh, when you apply uh, stress then you get polarization at the faces of piezoelectric and when you apply electric field uh, you get the deformation and there are variety of material which show this effect you have quartz you have um, uh, Rochelle salt, you have uh, barium titanate, lead titanate, lead zirconate titanate, variety of materials and the piezoelectric constant for these materials can be quite high. Uh, some of these materials show piezoelectric constant as high as uh, 200, 300 picometer per volt, uh, which is a very large displacement uh, from the device point of view. And then finally, we looked at <coughs> uh, just like you have to pull up a, a piezoelectric material to uh, use it. Uh, you can also depole it and depolarization of pi piezoelectric is essentially loss of polarization upon either thermal uh, cycling or electrical electric cycling or stress cycling. So, we looked at all these three mechanisms in a, a cartoon and animation and then uh, so you can go through them again. Now, now what we will do in this lecture is we will we'll look at some of the common piezoelectric materials. And among this category, the first candidate which is simple piezoelectric is barium titanate. And this barium titanate as you know already it has a perovskite structure and <coughs> so you have this barium titanate unit cell. And which is and this material is uh, ferroelectric. Uh, below the Curie temperature and Curie temperature happens to be roughly 120 degree centigrade. And, uh, and this material is a very useful material uh, in the sense of fuses, it is very it's easy to make and the ionic positions if you remember you have oxygen atom sitting at the faces and then you have um, barium atom going on the at the corners of the unit cell and then and then you have a smaller titanium atom going at the center of the uh, unit cell. So, this is uh, barium, this is titanium and this is oxygen and uh, this is a very useful material in the sense that uh, it has a simple crystal structure. It can also be doped by variety of elements like cobalt. So, you can so doping with cobalt is Uh, cobalt 3 plus ions is very common and this leads to reduced losses in the material. So, cobalt reduces the losses uh, so this is an useful property um, uh, which happens when you dope it. Now, doping is a uh, although it sounds very easy one must take 
enough care during processing so that you don't have reduction of cobalt 3 plus to cobalt 2 plus which is also a possibility because COO is a stable state as well and and then you can also replace uh, so cobalt uh, replace can replace titanium and then you can also replace titanium atom by um, zirconium or tin and these lead to increase in the in the TC and uh, um, so it, it also tends to enhance the piezoelectric properties and uh, you can also replace barium, barium can be replaced by bigger ions such as lead or calcium and they happen to lower the uh, TC of uh, uh, barium titanate especially from tetragonal to orthorhombic transition which happens below 120 degree centigrade. Uh, so, basically all these dopants can be used to control the piezoelectric property of the material and uh, you, you know the polar vector of barium titanate is along 0 0 1 axis in the ferroelectric state uh, where it has a tetragonal structure. So, uh, I am not going to spend too much time on this structure because you, we have already discussed this structure in the ferroelectric materials, but uh, so just as, a just as a material of interest I am going to tell you about this little bit. So, this, and the next material of interest is which is actually more important than this material is lead zirconium titanium oxide or often called as PZT. And this is a very important material, it is solid solution of lead titanate and lead zirconate. So, basically what it has a, it has a perovskite structure of the type lead titanate where the B site is randomly occupied by either of titanium and zirconium ions and um, so you have again the similar sort of structure. Uh, so, you have lead ions sitting here and oxygen ions go to the um, let me use a different color. So, oxygen ions go to the faces face centers the central atom is titanium. So, of course, titanium is shifted towards this axis if the structure was tetragonal and if the structure was rhombohedral then it would be shifted along 1 1 1. So, it has two structures essentially uh, the parent structure of lead titanate is tetragonal in the ferroelectric phase and this is rhombohedral. So, depending upon the composition uh, depending upon the proportion of lead titanate and lead zirconate uh, with respect to each other, the material PZT either adopts a tetragonal structure or rhombohedral structure. A uh, tetragonal structure has a polar vector along 0 0 1 and rhombohedral structure has along 1 1 1. So, this is the difference which occurs when you go from tetragonal to rhombohedral side and the phase diagram of this material is so the, uh, just before we go to phase diagram let me complete this. So, you have here lead atom then these are oxygen atoms and this atom is titanium uh, sorry titanium titanium or zirconium T i or Z r. So, this B site is randomly occupied by either of titanium and zirconium ions. So, uh, let me let me show you the uh, phase diagram of this material. So, you have it, ha it makes a continuous solid solution. So, what you have is a uh, on one end. So, it is a pseudo binary diagram phase diagram. So, you have P B Z R O 3 and then you have P B T I O 3 and if you if you plot with respect to mole percent P T which is lead titanate. So, you get something like uh, you, and then this point corresponds to. So, what you have here is you have a cubic phase here uh, this is of course, temperature and um, and this is somewhere between. So, this is about uh, 500 degree centigrade and this is somewhere around 600 degree centigrade 
and here you have lead titanate whose T c is significant uh, sorry uh, Kelvin not centigrade. So, you have Kelvin and this is approximately 850 Kelvin or so uh, or maybe 800 Kelvin or so. So, you have cubic at the top which is above this phase boundary which is on the top and then between these phase boundaries you have here in this uh, region what you have is a called as a rotational phase. In this phase boundary you have ferroelectric rhombohedral phase and what you have here is uh, so this is high temperature uh, rhombohedral phase and then this is low temperature rhombohedral phase. Now, the, the, there is some demarcation which has been shown by scientists between these two phases uh, details of which we are not going to go into uh, it is beyond the scope of this thing, but what you have is a some distinction between these two phases. So, low temperature ferroelectric phase here and then again this is rhombohedral in nature and then you have tetragonal phase here ferroelectric tetragonal phase here. So, you can see that uh, beyond this uh, so across this boundary uh, which is uh, this phase boundary on one side on the lead titanate rich side you have tetragonal ferroelectric phase below the top phase boundary below the transition because this top phase boundary depicts a transition okay, from ferroelectric to uh, paraelectric phase. So, cubic this is paraelectric phase and on the left of this phase boundary vertical phase boundary you have a rhombohedral ferroelectric phase uh, which is uh, again below the cubic region. Now, this boundary which separates these two region is called as a morphotropic phase boundary. or it is called as M P B. Okay. So, this M P B B is of immense importance because what happens is that across M P B you have existence of either rhombohedral structure or tetragonal structure, but the moment we come to M P B whose composition is happens to be around 53 47. So, 53 um, um, or roughly about 50 50 let us say. So, around this morphotropic phase boundary what you have is uh, coexistence of both these phases. So, at this M P B you have coexistence of tetragonal and rhombohedral phases. So, if you take morphotropic phase boundary composition you are likely to have both of these phases present if you have made the sample properly and this morphotropic phase boundary as a result results in a large enhancement in the property. Why, why it happens is because since you have both the phases present you have tetragonal phase present you have rhombohedral present and both of these phases have polar vector in different directions as a result when you switch when you use the material when you apply electric field or stress to it you have many polar directions which are available for piezoelectric activity. So, as a result the polling of this material becomes very easy. So, this material uh, near M P B composition which is 50 50 composition has a very significant importance for a variety of applications simply because the properties are enhanced significantly near this composition and remember this is called as a morphotropic phase boundary. Let me just circle it for you or often called as M P B. And this MPB composition in uh, PZT is an extremely important composition from the technological point of view because of enhancement of properties. So, so you can write here. So, properties which are ferroelectric as well as piezoelectric are enhanced near. M P B in uh, P Z T and this is also true about other systems as well not only P Z T other examples are for instance B I F E O 3 uh, 
PBTiO3. So again, BiFeO3 is also ferroelectric. PBTiO3 is also ferroelectric, and both of these make a continuous solid solution. And again, they also exhibit a piece, uh, MPB at at 7030 composition, 70 percent bismuth ferrite and 30 percent lead titanate mole percent. And at at this composition, again in this system. Uh, one, the transition temperature is high because lead titanate uh, bismuth ferrite transition temperature is much higher than lead titanate transition temperature. So, overall solid solution has a reasonably high transition temperature. Two, the, the, the piezoelectric coefficient attains uh, piezoelectric coefficient as well as polarization attain uh, a large enhancement near the MPB in, in at least in the bulk form and thin film form. And um, so, this is uh, um, so uh, PZT is a very important material from this point of view that uh, especially near the morphotropic phase boundary composition. Now, you can change the properties of PZT uh, by doping again just like in case of barium titanate if you dope it with other, other elements the properties change. Now, um, typically what happens is that most of these oxides tend to be uh, so oxides uh, tend to be deficient in uh, oxygen and from the defect chemistry you know. So, now oxygen vacancy is now these are charge defects right. The moment you have charge defects you have problem with the conduction. So, as a result the conductivity of sample is higher and the sample tends to be lossy and conducting. Now, how to get rid of this problem? So, if you have oxygen vacancies which are noted by V O O dot dot, so which means they contain two positive charges. So, if you dope the material by let us say a material like element like lanthanum, so, uh, so if you dope the material like La 2 O 3, so lanthanum goes to uh, let us say um, on lead site or titanium site, it, it goes to lead site and um, P Z L T yes and then what you have is basically uh, lanthanum carries one extra charge. So, as a result it carries uh, one positive charge. Now, two lanthanum will go to two lead sites, three oxygens will go to three oxygen sites. So, you need to create, uh, so what can happen is you need to create uh, either now side balance is not maintained because for each lead you have one oxygen. Now, here you are using three oxygen for two leads. So, side balance is not maintained in order to do that if you have an oxygen vacancy here V O O this V O O is compensated by this extra oxygen. So, not only so two oxygens go to the regular oxygen sites and another oxygen goes to the vacant oxygen site thereby. So, if you look at the charge balance two positive on the oxygen vacancy two positive on the two lanthanum sites and lanthanum occupying lead sites and this maintains a charge and side balance, but also it reduces the reduction in the oxygen vacancy and this leads to improve properties of the uh, material. And so, basically reduc reduction in defect density upon lanthanum doping. And these defects also have uh, not only they increase the conductivity, but they also tend to uh, uh, impede the domain motion because you know that the domain uh, in the ferroelectric materials they nucleate and then they grow. So, this growth of these domains or when you switch the material the switching of domains is impeded by these defects. These defects typically uh, pin these boundaries and these boundaries are not able to move uh, the way you would like them to move. So, as a result uh, the properties degrade. So, these this particular aspect can be tackled by doping with appropriate elements which lead to reduction in the defect density. And this has also other advantages it reduce, reduces the dielectric losses, it increases it, it also uh, improves the coupling coefficient and it also re leads to reduction in the coercivity as a result of easy domain motion. So, what we are going to now do is, so we have discussed these two materials which are important materials. There are variety of other materials as well which are reported in the literature. So, if you go to the uh, journals and some books you can find a discussion on other materials as well. So, uh, now what we will do is that we will look at the how these properties are measured.
Now, measurement of piezoelectric property of piezoelectric material is important, and these techniques are typically called as resonance. And basically, uh, there, these measurements are used to measure the displacement when you apply electric field. So, basically, they rely on measurement of displacement upon electric field. So, now, what happens is in the resonance of first we will discuss the resonance technique. So, in the resonance technique the uh, you measure that uh, characteristic resonance frequency of the material uh, which depends upon the frequency application of the alternating field and this is ideally used for bulk samples. So, essentially it is about measurement of resonance frequencies and typically it is used for bulk samples and now uh, we can also uh, model this uh, response of the material by electrical circuit so you have so the so basically you have this electrical circuit so you have this capacitance in series with the resistance and then you have an inductance which is in parallel with capacitance again. So, this part of the circuit so basically this is C m r l and this is C d. So, the variety and this equivalent circuit gives you the uh, sort of models the behavior of the material well enough and this part top part of the circuit represents the mechanical contribution and this part represents the electrical contribution and uh, uh, so this electro so basically what the response of the uh, uh, material is electromechanical so as a result uh, so you you have coupling of electrical and mechanical parameters. So, as a result you need to separate out the electrical part and the mechanical part and this is what the circuit does. It separates the electrical and mechanical parts and, uh, <coughs> and this happens uh, and this is applicable uh, when, when you are when the frequencies are close to a characteristic or resonance frequencies and so what you basically do is that. So, so when you plot as a function of frequency because you are applying AC field, AC field is frequency dependent. So, at some frequency you are going to have resonance which is going to occur. So, what you have if you uh, if you measure the reactance, now this reactance goes as, so this is your resonance and basically you are interested in calculating the frequency around which this resonance occurs and typically for these measurements you take a material of uh, cylindrical shape. So, essentially a rod and this rod could be about 6 inch in length and in diameter it is about quarter inch or so. So, these kind of samples are taken for these measurements. Um, this, and this is uh, and uh, when you when you plot electrical reactance as a frequency then you come across the characteristic frequency which is basically the uh, uh, frequency that you want to uh, measure and there are two frequencies here excuse me there are two frequencies here one is the series frequency second is the parallel frequency and uh, you need to be uh, able to you need to and you can ut utilize these frequencies to determine what is called as a coupling coefficient. So, this coupling coefficient which is k 3 3 
this can be expressed in terms of series and parallel resonance frequencies. So, this k 3 3 can be uh, so this k 3 3 square basically is equal to pi by 2 into f s by f p multiplied by tan of pi by 2 into f s sorry f p minus f s divided by f p. So, this f s is series resonance frequency and f p is parallel resonance frequency. And, and if you use this relation along with the elastic compliance, so uh, elastic compliance as we know is denoted as S E T 3 at constant uh, field and then low frequency dielectric constant is uh, uh, epsilon 3 3 and then piezoelectric coefficient is d 3 3 then if you couple the uh, the k 3 3 coupling coefficient as we measured in the previous slide as we wrote in the previous slide if you couple with these two parameters you can determine d 3 3. So, d 3 3 is equal to k 3 3 multiplied by s e 3 3 into epsilon 3 3 x to the power half. So, this is the expression for determination of d 3 3. So, just by applying electric field to a rod sample you measure the reactance of this sample by modeling in terms of electrical circuit find out the series and parallel frequencies and then put these frequencies in the expression of k, k 3 3 to find out k 3 3 and if you know the elastic compliance of the material and low frequency directed constant which can be found out from the dielectric measurements you can determine what is the uh, piezoelectric coupling coefficient. Now, these <coughs> the, 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 the limitation with this process is that the fundamental resonance frequencies are determined by the uh, fundamental uh, or resonance frequencies of the sample are determined by the fundamental vibration modes. Now, this is uh, typically in, in case of piezoelectric samples it happens in the gigahertz frequency range and these gigahertz frequencies are very high frequencies me making measurements in so, in these range uh, these frequency ranges is not easy. So, so what you have limitations is uh, frequencies at resonance fall in gigahertz range. So, measurements are difficult because you need to adopt variety of tricks in order to a uh, variety of uh, precautions to make the measurements at gigahertz frequencies. And uh, so, in such cases what you do is that basically you measure the uh, do the measurement in the sub resonance frequency. So, sub resonance methods and basically in the sub resonance method what happens is that typically for thin films this is important. So, when you have thin film, thin films are always deposited on a substrate. So, uh, the substrate can be used as, uh, as a sub res uh, so, so the peak of uh, uh, so you can determine the uh, you can use the substrate as a means to determine the piezoelectric coupling of the uh, film. And uh, <coughs> so, again the problem here is uh, characteristic frequencies are also determined by electromechanical response of the material and and if the if the, if the electrochemical frequency mechanical frequencies are not uh, characteristic frequencies are smaller in number then of course, the uh, measurement becomes difficult. Um, sub resonance. <coughs> so, in case of uh, thin film uh, you can just if you go to previous slide 
in case of let us say thin films. use resonance of substrates. So, in the in the case of sub resonance basically measurements um, at frequencies below resonance frequencies. So, basically uh, these frequencies are at, at, much, at much lower frequencies which is attainable and without any difficulty and <coughs> so at resonance frequency which are nothing but characteristic norm, uh, fundamental uh, vibration modes and basically this basically is nothing but measurement of direct effect and you know what direct effect is basically the uh, you measure the charge which is developed on the faces of piezoelectric under the application of uh, uh, stress and direct effect as well as indirect effect which is the measurement of displacement or strain as a result of applied electric field. <coughs> so, although here the displacements can be very small but nowadays we have techniques which can measure these displacements such as AFM etcetera. So, uh, AL, AFM you can have strain gauges, high quality strain gauges, LVDTs which is uh, linear variable differential transformers. So, all these um, so basically uh, technological advances have enabled us to measure these small displacements. So, small dis displacements, but they can be measured by techniques like AFM, LVDT high precision gauges etcetera. So, basically you uh, in summary there are two techniques one is a resonance technique second is sub resonance technique. Resonance technique essentially relies upon the measurement of the characteristic frequencies of vibration. Uh, these, but the problem with here is that these frequencies can be quite high which means in the gigahertz or higher range and these frequencies make the life of a um, characterization person difficult. So, as a result these are not often successful. What you have is sub resonance method where you measure either the polarization or the displacement. Uh, the, the trouble with these methods is that the amount of charge which is developed or amount of uh, strain which is developed can be very small, but nowadays we have techniques which can measure all these uh, small changes. So, as a result sub resonance methods have become much more common. Uh, <coughs> what we will do now is we will just have a look at some of the applications of piezoelectric materials uh, before we move on to the next uh, material, uh, next system. Now, as you know <coughs> piezoelectric materials since they have direct effect and con converse effect and which means they either give rise to changes in the polarization or uh, changes in the uh, dimension of the sample or strain. Uh, you can use them in variety of applications. So, for instance, uh, some of the early applications or some of the very trivial applications in the beginning for instance, you must have seen a gas lighter. Now, gas lighter when you press the button it, it gives rise to a spark and through which you light your gas and this can be used uh, this is this is called as a power generation method. So, basically in case of power generation so for instance as a gas lighter you can use a piezoelectric material and what basically you do is that in this case you you require two uh, piezoelectric pieces with two um, with different opposite polarization states so what you have is here is <coughs> um, you have a piezoelectric material like this and then another piezoelectric material close to it okay. and these two faces have similar charges. Okay. So, you have positive positively oriented faces here 
So, this positive, so you have two faces which are of opposite polarity or uh, same polarity next to each other. So of course, you need to put a sort of you need to put electrodes on the faces and and essentially you connect these together. So, and this is basically the spark gap, because when you bring these together uh, then since they are of similar charges there is a sparking and that is sparking give you guys give, gives rise to this spark which is used to light the uh, flammable substances. So, application of basically stress or uh, um, stress will induce a change in the polarization. So, when you apply stress, so when you press the button basically you are applying the stress. So, when you press the stress this induces a change in the polarization of the faces and this gives rise to a spark creation of charges and this creation of charges leads to uh, creation of a spark and uh, uh, and then you have charge flow uh, through the electrical circuit giving rise to uh, uh, light. And the problem is the whole phenomena happens fairly quickly. So, uh, in order to use this as a as a pro, as a method of power generation let us say here very small power is generated. So, as a uh, so in order to use this device as a gas lighter it has to happen extremely quickly. So, because the voltage which is which, is, which would be generated between the faces will quickly disappear. So, one needs to use this as very quick or sort of instantaneous method. because you must have seen that the moment you press the lighter the spark come instantaneously, but it does not stay for long. So, one must uh, use this immediately. The second application which is of importance uh, using <coughs> piezoelectric material in power generation is uh, power transformers. Now, in contrast to uh, regular transformers which basically use the uh, electromagnetic coupling between the input and the output here what you have is utilize. So, these here what you have piezoelectric materials which utilize the acoustic coupling uh, which are or rather which are based on based on acoustic coupling effect due to converse piezoelectric effect. And what it means is that when you apply electric field the piezoelectric generates strain and these strains can be large enough to give rise to acoustic waves and so you have uh, so and then you can couple these waves in order to create high uh, voltages. And these can be used as used as compact devices they do not necessarily need to be of large size and uh, uh, essentially this alternating stress which is created by alternating field can be quite large in nature. And essentially um, the frequency ranges that we are interested here is uh, vibration frequency is of the order of 100 kilohertz to 1 megahertz and the step up ratios of typically 1000 to, to 1 uh, can be achieved. Um, a, 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 di a simple diagram for this is uh, shown uh, in the next slide, I will show you in the next slide. So, what you have here is essentially a piezoelectric material so the way the circuit is drawn here is so you apply low voltage here this is the low voltage side and coupling between the piezoelectrics give rise to high voltage on this side. So, essentially it is about applying electric field alternating electric field which gives rise to large stresses because of uh, in converse effect and this gives rise to acoustic waves these acoustic waves, waves coupled with each other in order to give rise 
uh, high voltages in the uh, transformer made of piezoelectric material. So, uh, in, com in comparison to normal devices, this can be this can be very small in size. And the next application that uh, one could think is a piezoelectric sensor. So, in these typically um, uh, uh, you use mechanical force or pressure. So, use of mechanical pressure to given electrical signal. So, basically uh, for instance uh, this is used in microphone. In case of microphone the sound waves can deform the piezoelectric element and this gives rise to a changing voltage. So, essentially sound waves give rise to a deformation and this gives rise to voltage change and so and this is this is a principle which is also used in for instance in variety of guitars and other microphones and um, so this is one application which is which where you sense the input to give an output okay so uh, typically it's based on use of mechanical pressure which is the input to give an electrical output from a piezoelectric material. So, this is what it is. So, essentially you have a piezoelectric material, you give an input and this input is typically mechanical and what you get an output. Uh, other applications, uh, sense other sensor applications are So, for instance you can have uh, detection and generation of sonar waves. This is something which was used in world war as well. And uh, you can also determ uh, determine for instance the precise movement of you can use piezoelectric um, to control the uh, fuel supply in an in a automotive engine. So, to control the fuel supply in an automotive engine. Um, it can also be used for detection of acoustic emissions. And it can also be used as a strain gauge. So, in most of these applications the input remains a mechanical signal and output is electrical signal. You can have uh, many other applications, uh, you can have medical applications, in case of medical applications uh, first could be kidney stone treatment. So, essentially what happens is that when you high when you apply a high frequency uh, field to, to the to the sample and this gives rise to change in the shape of the material, this gives rise to cost, this gives rise to basically emission of waves which are uh, in the in whose frequency in the ultrasound range these are called the ultrasound waves and these ultrasound waves are then passed through the body, they hit the, uh, the, the, the kidney stone and shatter it and then which can pass through the urine. Um, so, this is I will show you the animation of this and the second could be um, um, ultrasound imaging. And this is typically used uh, um, in the case of a pregnant woman to, to uh, image the to determine the sex of the uh, child um, before the birth in the fetus. So, I will show you the animation of this as well and uh, so we will just go to the animation. Just so, this is the gas lighter. So, just to go back. 
So, um, if you remember first application that we talked was the um, gas lighter. So, piezoelectric can be used to generate a spark which ignites gases by generating a current and again just to acknowledge this was taken from doitpoms.ac.uk. So, basically for this we take two piezoelectric material and in such a manner so that their polarization is reversed. So, you have these two materials and the polarization of these two material is in opposite direction and when you apply the stress the polarization uh, changes as a result of application of stress which means the increase in the polarization here. So, you bring the faces with the similar charges together in order to create a spark. So, these are the two similar faces and then they are connected to a circuit and when you bring them together they generate a charge when you apply stress and uh, and this charge travels to the circuit giving rise to a spark in the in the gap and this leads to creation of a flame. So, this is something which has to happen very quickly as I said before and the other application was uh, based on let me just find out. So, uh, the first one so as I said piezoelectrics have found applications in medical area Again, this uh, animation is taken from doitpoms.ac.uk. So, we acknowledge uh, their help with this. So, the first one is non evasive treatment, which is the kidney treatment. So, basically, when you apply a field of high frequency to a piezoelectric, the resultant the, you have a resultant change in the shape, and that gives rise to creation of ultrasound waves. So, so, this is how you are doing you are applying stress to the uh, you, are, you are changing the uh, you are applying a field of changing frequency as a result the material is compressing or expanding and this compression expansion of materials alternating gives rise to ultrasound waves. And these ultrasound waves when they are pointed towards a kidney stone for instance in a body they can uh, basically uh, break it and this is a very good technique for um, uh, breaking of kidney stones and this can pass through the body fluids uh, later on when it becomes a smaller size. Other technique is used in the imaging and here basically the uh, is based on again you generate the ultra ultrasound waves by application of electric field and these ultrasound waves in this case they can reflect from the tissue boundaries and they can be and these reflected waves can be observed uh, to produce the image of the internal body for instance uh, a fetus. And uh, uh, basically Again as I said that uh, these ultrasound waves are produced by applying field of high frequency or reversing the electric field over it. So, uh, so the principle is same. So, the waves these waves they pass through the body until they hit a boundary and some of them will reflect. So, uh, so essentially this is the body and the waves have traveled in this direction and some of them have reflected back. And, and they again are collected through the same piezoelectric and when the when the these waves will hit a piezoelectric they will again create uh, change in the polarization or uh, give rise to charge and this can be used to monitor the uh, magnitude of this charge can be used to monitor the uh, image. So, so, ultrasound waves cause the reverse effect the converse effect and by altering the shape of the piezoelectric this causes a charge to be produced on the end of the piezoelectric which can be detected. And as a result you get a and this is interpreted by the computer giving rise to a image. So, this is what I wanted to show you these two these um, basically these slides just to show you the applications. So, finally uh, and these are also used in uh, some applications like actuators. Nowadays, the engineering or technological advances are very happen at very precise scale. So, earlier the precision could be of millimeter level, but now the precisions have gone into the range of micron and sub micron range. So, as a result to achieve this technological perfection the devices need translation which is as precise. So, the so the basically the linear motion or the rotational motion have to be of very high precision. So, in this case piezoelectrics can be used quite well because piezoelectrics as you know when you apply electric field they have a displacement which is of the order of microns or even sub microns or picometers it is a picometer to microns and this helps us in 
controlling the translation or rotation in a device to, to very high accuracy. So, <coughs> essentially here application of high electric field and this high electric field uh, without uh, now you have to use it without the oscillations. So, this high electric field gives rise to extremely small changes in the crystal dimension. So, of course, you have to use a material whose piezoelectric constant is likewise appropriate and the precision here could be can be better than a micron. Uh, so, that, that tells you the level of accuracy that we are achieving here and that is, that is why these uh, piezoelectrics can be used as a very useful precise actuators, motors etcetera and uh, so you can use voltages of the order of 150, 200 volt and in this these can be used for instance in the material in the thin film form which can give you displacements of the order of microns as you um, said. So, um, again uh, let me just uh, give you some of the applications of sensing application uh, this actuator applications. So, actuator applications can be used for instance in uh, uh, AFM. In AFM uh, atomic force microscope you move the tip of the sample by taking the tip up and down and this movement has to be very precise and this precise movement is achieved by the use of a piezoelectric material. You can have piezoelectric motors and these motors basically you have a uh, you have up and down movement through rotation and this happens extremely precisely since, since and this you can control by uh, changing the electric field that you apply. Uh, <coughs> we can do mirror alignment, especially in the laser area where the laser mirror alignment have to be very precise, uh, loudspeakers <coughs> and inkjet printer another very important use of piezoelectric material. Here uh, by changing the electric field you can control the precision of piezoelectric diaphragm to, uh, to regulate the supply of ink on the, on the paper and of course, the uh, fuel injectors in the engines etcetera. So, all of these are very important applications and finally, uh, last application that I am going to talk about is frequency standard. So, frequency standards basically uh, piezoelectric materials can be used as a standard of frequency and this is what happens in quartz watches. The watches that we wear they contain piezoelectric and uh, uh, they use, uh, so basically you have a quartz tuning fork which uses a combination of direct and converse effect and to give you uh, a regulated pulses, uh, electrical pulses which are used to uh, correctly mark the time and they have since these materials have fundamental frequency of vibration at very specific frequencies, uh, uh, they can be used to uh, stabilize the frequency. Um, when you apply a periodic voltage, then you can stabilize the frequency of vibration and these frequencies are very precise frequencies. So, you can determine, you can use these frequency as a standard and this is also used, same principles is also used in radio uh, transmitters as well as receivers. So, uh, uh, whose details I am not going to go into, but if you want to go into uh, details of applications of piezoelectrics, uh, I would suggest that you uh, go through the books on electroceramics by Moulson and Herbert. Uh, these titles are also provided in the bibliography of the course as a, as a separate link. So, uh, you can go through them. So, we will finish the lecture today here uh, which was essentially uh, which is essentially end of piezoelectric materials. In the next lecture we will take up the case of uh, pyroelectric materials and then we finish this discussion on nonlinear dielectrics. Thank you.